You are very welcome as you join with us in this online service from Khalid and Lone Ends Presbyterian Churches. Whoever you are and wherever you are, we pray that you will know God's blessing as we worship him in our separate places today. As the coronavirus pandemic continues with renewed vigour, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, along with the other main denominations, has decided that we should suspend all in-person gatherings in our church buildings, at least until the 6th of February. While it's disappointing that we cannot gather together for worship in our church buildings, we realise that this is necessary to curb the spread of this terrible virus. We hope that these online services will enable us to worship together virtually for the meantime. As part of this pre-recorded service, there will be a little section for children. So we hope that families will have the opportunity to worship together. There will be a downloadable worksheet, activity sheet for children, and also a downloadable version of today's sermon. So let's worship God together. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Our opening praise is King of the Ages, Almighty God. The psalmist models for us a transparent faith with these words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, 
and lead me in the way everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading today by making our own transparent confession. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we bow and confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings and our offences against you. You alone know how we have sinned and wandered from your ways and wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. All we can say is, Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are truly ashamed and sorry for all that we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins. Help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And to God, as we gather together, we pray that you will speak to us from your word. As we join our voices, though we are separated in praise, may you be glorified in all we do. For Christ's sake. Amen. Boys and girls, imagine your friend is taken ill. You need to get them to the hospital as soon as possible. So you take them there. But when you get to the emergency department, there are so many people waiting to get in to get treatment that you can't even get near the door, much less get in. Then you notice some stairs leading up to the roof. If you could carry your friend up to the roof, then you could make a hole in that roof and lower him down into the doctor's office. Do you think that would be possible? Do you think you'd be willing to try it? Well, you know, this is almost exactly what happened when a group of men wanted to take a sick friend to Jesus. Let's listen to the story. When Jesus saw how much faith these four friends he had, he not only healed the paralyzed man, he forgave him of all his sins. Let's hear the story. sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To wow, save the world. man. Clearly, he hasn't read the Torah. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. We're, we're late. Don't you complain when you're the one who kept stopping for lunch and morning tea and rest breaks and dessert joy and... <sighs> I'm sorry, man. I, I know this was important to you. Hang on! Levi, if you're afraid of heights, raise your hand. <laughs> what? Yay! Hey, V! Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do heal in your hometown what we have heard. What? Truly, look. Look out! Look out. When the sky was wet. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Forgiving sins? Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Get up, take your mat, and go home.
Boys and girls, we all have friends who need to come to Jesus. It might not be easy for us to get them to Jesus. But you know, if each of us does our part, together we can succeed. We'll meet many obstacles. But like those friends in the story, we must never give up. Like the four men in the story, we must hold on to our corner of the blanket and carry on until we bring our friends to know Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we all have friends who need your healing and your forgiveness. May we be faithful in helping to bring them to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to join in a little song, a joyful one called, I'll Praise the Lord. Let's read God's Word together. We read from 1 John and chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the Word of Life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. 
In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We thank God for his word. And before we begin to meditate upon it, we join in the song, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. satisfaction in thrills, conquest, romance, wealth, education, 
Yeah, and even religion. There's nothing wrong with these experiences as long as we recognize that they are really only a temporary diversion. They don't satisfy over the long haul. Wanting something real and finding something real are two different things. It's a bit like eating meringues. They promise a lot but actually deliver very little reality. That's why for the next few Sundays we're going to look at the first letter of John in the New Testament. The theme of 1 John is, is a life that is real. John is writing as an elderly man and in his possibly almost 100 years on earth he's discovered that a satisfaction is not found in things or in thrills. But reality is found in the person of Jesus Christ. First, a few helpful trivia to understand John. John's the author of five books, one of the four Gospels, three letters, and the final and mysterious book of the Bible, Revelation. Matthew's Gospel tells the story of Jesus calling John to become one of his twelve disciples. You remember he called Peter and Andrew, who were fishermen casting their nets, and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Then he saw James and his brother John in a boat with their father mending their nets. Jesus called them too and they left their boat and their father and followed Jesus. Interesting, when John was called to follow Jesus, he was mending nets. And we find throughout his life and throughout his writings, John was a mender. He noticed broken people, broken things. He helped put things and lives back together again. John, we could say, he spent his life restoring what was damaged and ruined. John was the last surviving member of the original Twelve, one of the few not to be martyred. That means when John wrote his Gospel and his letters, he was writing for second and third generation believers. An old man writing to young people. And writing from, of course, a perspective that no one else could have had. William Barclay writes, by around AD 100 Christianity had become a thing of habit, traditional, half-hearted, nominal. John was writing when the thrill was gone and the flame of devotion had died to a flicker. Some of us are second, third, fourth or maybe even more generation Christians. But if we aren't careful and vigilant our faith can evolve into nothing more than a habit, a ritual. Our prayers can end up powerless, our Bible reading stale, our fellowship lacking sincerity. Susan Humbert of Cincinnati Christian University writes in the introduction to her book, Proverbial Secrets. Just as Snow White was saved from eternal death by true love's kiss, we too were saved by the same life-giving power. Unlike Prince Charming, our salvation didn't appear in a red velvet cloak draped over a bent knee before a glass-covered coffin. It came about through the sacrifice of a skin-shredded body nailed to a splintered and blood-spattered wooden cross. That's the message that John brings across in his Gospel and in his letters. And God gave this last disciple of Jesus a huge assignment, writing letters to a generation of younger Christians, reminding them of his face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus and hoping to wake them up from their life of lethargy. John opens his first letter by explaining to his readers that they can trust what he has to say. Because he knew Jesus personally. He had heard Jesus speak. He saw Jesus. He touched Jesus. Both before he died and after he rose from the dead. So he tells his readers, What I have seen, heard and handled, I pass on to you. And he passes it on to us so that we too can experience fellowship with Jesus. John was writing in a time of fake news. There were other teachers about who claimed to have special revelations of the truth. 
but they hadn't known Jesus. Much of what they said was something they'd made up. John says in chapter 2, Children, time is just a bit up. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. Well, they're all over the place. Antichrists are everywhere you look. And there have always been imposters. Satan himself equated himself to God. He masquerades as an angel of light, as an imposter. And just as there were charlatans in the first century, there are some around today too. Even though John was writing between maybe 95 and 100 AD, what he wrote is still relevant to us today. Still speaks to modern Christians, transcending the centuries. So we would be wise to play a close attention to it. Very relevant question for us at this time is, how do we pass on the truth to the next generation so that they have the truth? It seems that more and more we're losing our children and young people to the world. Every generation, you know, has a choice to make. The Gospel letters of John may have been written to address this very subject. John writes to build up Christian believers in their faith and in love. Over and over again he tells them and tells us why he is writing these things. Over and over again he reminds them and us of what we should already know. And it's good to be reminded again and again. John's written writing these letters after the first generation of Christians, apart from maybe himself, have passed on. The new generation is on the scene. And some are not content with the message they've received. It's always a great danger that the next generation will want something different, something new, something improved. And as a result, they'll depart from the truth. But often when that newness wears off, what happens next? Is that all there is to church, they will say? Some will say they're disillusioned. The term disillusion technically means to remove an illusion or a false euphoria. It means to come to reality. And that's what John wants us to be like. John tells us that the gospel is the only ultimate reality. The only thing that offers eternal benefits of fellowship with God, with one another and with complete joy. And we must not depart from it. We read in the Acts of the Apostles how the first Christians were filled with glorious, inexpressible joy, spreading the message of the gospel, even as they faced trials of opposition, persecution and suffering. But many years have passed by the time John's writing, and this new generation is now the church. And there is a severe doctrinal struggle with these false teachers leading people astray. Who are these false teachers? The church has faced suffering of persecution, but it seems that that had lessened. It's a bit more peaceful now, and some of the Christians of the new generation want to make Christianity fit into the world around them. They want to make it more respectable. They want a faith that fits in, you know, one that works well with the philosophy of the times. And of course, that's not a problem unique to the first gen century. It's been a recurring theme throughout history and is a very real and live issue for us today. Many today have rejected some of the fundamental teachings of the Bible so that they can fit in more with contemporary ideas, particularly in the area of morality. In the latter part of the first century, there were three major types of new teaching that arose that came into full bloom in the second century. They were Docetists, Nicolaitans and Gnostics. Each of these groups used Greek philosophy and worldly wisdom tried to update, as they saw it, improve on the basic teaching of the gospel as taught by the apostles. John addresses these new teachers. He calls them out as liars, deceivers, antichrist, against Christ. And over the next few weeks, we look at some of the things that, that they did and said. I think, therefore, it's relevant and timely for us to study through John's letters together. 
They are some of the most simple and practical New Testament books on Christian living, especially in difficult times. And don't we find ourselves in difficult times for many reasons? We'll find that these letters explore grand themes of the Christian faith that can help us to refute and correct false teachings that are around us. They have a beautiful, positive message for every Christian, offering clear assurance of eternal life to obedient believers in Christ. As John himself puts it concisely in his Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, Lord, for you have fed us with your word, grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints. We offer you now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for all people. Oh God, we thank you for the good news of the gospel the good news that Jesus Christ, your Son, came into this world, that he died on a cross for the sins of all the world and rose again, that you have given the gift of your Holy Spirit to us, your people. Lord, we thank you for all your gifts and for all your goodness. But Lord, we know that we live in a needy world, a world that needs to hear of Jesus, a world that is full of many problems and difficulties. And so we come with our prayers for others. We remember before you those who are ill at this time. Lord, the coronavirus that has affected us now for almost a year seems to be even more rampant. Lord, we give thanks for the vaccines that have been discovered and for the way they are being rolled out. Uh, but Lord, we know the disease uh, is mutating and that many are affected by it. Lord, we lift up before you those who are ill at home or in hospital at present, those who are worried or anxious, those who are caring for them. Lord, we remember our National Health Service and those who are serving us in great difficulty at this time. Lord, you hold the destiny of the nations in your hand. We pray for our land. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they may work together to bring peace and prosperity to our land. Lord, guide them in difficult decisions they have to make at the moment. Lord, we pray for your church throughout the earth. Lord, despite the difficulties that we face at the moment here in our land, we thank you that we can worship together. We thank you for the means of sharing uh, through the, the internet. And Lord, we pray, though we are separated, you will continue to encourage us and build us up. And Lord, soon that this virus may be under control and we will be able to join together and meet again. Lord God of love, send your Spirit's blessing to us, your children. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. And in his name we offer these and all our prayers. Amen. Our closing hymn is All My Ways Are Known to You.
Go forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge to us. We should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has loved us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.